So finally, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Linda Griffith. Uh, for those of you who didn't have a chance to uh, chat with her before the event started, uh, she's an, a distinguished alumna of Georgia Tech with a PhD in chemical engineering uh, from Berkeley. She's been part of the MIT uh, faculty since 1991. And among, among many, many accomplishments, I think one that uh, probably she'll be forever associated with is the mouse with the ear on his back. <laughs> Um, the, uh, and that was, um, back, yeah, that was in early days. And, uh, since then, uh, she has gone on to do a great many things in the field of, of tissue engineering and has also was instrumental in launching, uh, MIT's first ever interdepartmental minor degree in biomedical engineering. And it was, became immensely popular and was the first major to be added to the curriculum. Um, it's course 20. Yeah, course 20. Yeah. Um, yeah, numerous, numerous accomplishments. Uh, the commercializing the 3D printing process for manufacturing F FDA approved scaffolds, the liver chip, synthetic, um, synthetic, matrix, synthetic matrices for tissue morphogenesis. Uh, she's a member of National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Medicine, National Academy of Inventors, National Academy of Arts and Sciences, has received the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, Radcliffe Fellowship, uh, the Gordon Prize for Innovation in Engineering and Technology Education, and she serves on advisory boards for the Society for Women's Health Research, and has served on advisory councils for the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research, and the, Na the National Institute of Arthritis and Musculoskeletal Diseases, and the advisory committee to the director of the NIH. With that, I will hand it over. Okay, it's always really fun to come meet alumni. I learned so many things from alumni and I'm thrilled when alumni come back, including those I've taught, but also especially those I have not met in the classroom before. So the award you didn't mention that I'm actually proudest of is I'm a McVicker Fellow at MIT, which is the teaching award. And I love, love, love teaching undergraduates at MIT, I'm very, very involved in that. And actually a lot of undergraduates have been involved in the work that I'll talk about today. So the advertised title of my talk is Humanizing Drug Development. And why would I wanna talk about that? It's, let me share my screen. Um, and what, what do we do in that regard? I'm going to talk about how we approach chronic inflammatory diseases, which I'll describe in a moment by taking the patient population and deconstructing them in a computational sense and conceptual sense, and then reconstructing these patients to test mechanisms of their disease and to test therapeutics. And we had to invent a whole suite of new tools for tissue engineering, but also for something called organs on chips to do that. And I brought some demos that some of you who were here for the reception are able to see. So what I'd love to do tonight is make the case that we need to humanize drug development that is happening best at MIT and that it is going to change this, the whole drug development scene. So first of all, what are chronic inflammatory diseases? These tend to be diseases that are chronic, things like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. Who has knows anyone with any, any of these, I, IBD, et cetera, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, Alzheimer's. Many infections can have in a very small population of patients, things like Lyme, people can get symptoms that last a very long time. And endometriosis, type two diabetes, these typically are systemic diseases. They're inflammatory, meaning the immune system is activated and they often are really hard to diagnose and treat. So what do these have in common? Many similar features. They can run in families, so there can be genetic linkage, but a lot of them are sporadic. So you could have no family history and get one of these. A lot of them have no clear genetic link, meaning it's not like sickle cell disease where there's a gene or cystic fibrosis. There's many, many genes or loci that have been discovered. And they're probably all interacting with environmental stressors to give rise to the symptoms in the patient. And these are often systemic because inflammation can affect not only the target organ like um, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis or GI, but you feel sick all over. It causes problems with absorption of nutrients, et cetera. 
And importantly, these are often very difficult to diagnose because many of them have symptoms that are sort of, there's not great metrics for, and it takes a long time till you get really sick that you're diagnosed. And then of course, there's often very uh, huge gaps in certainly in cures, but also even in effective therapies for the patient populations. And often the patient populations are very diverse. So for all these reasons, it turns out that although we can learn some useful things from animal models, the animals are not really replicating all the features of the disease. And we know example after example, and I'll talk about some, that things that work great in the animals fail in the humans or do not progress in the clinic. So how can we address that? Clearly, we need to move on from the animal models to human models. And how do we do that? So that's what I want to talk about. Because MIT is kind of the epicenter of doing this. Now, as examples, the primary examples I'm going to use are in mucosal barriers. These are the single layer epithelial cells. So epithelia are lining cells. They line all of our organs, um, all our body cavities. Your epidermis is actually an epithelial cell, but it's not a mucosal cell. So mucosal cells make mucus and they typically absorb things and secrete things. And they also are huge hotbeds of immunology. So the endometrium, the lining of the uterus where the embryo ultimately implants is a mucosal barrier. And the gut, the whole lining of the intestine, of course, is a mucosal barrier. And they have many features in common because they have stem cells, they have a lot of uh, immunology happening at them. So those are two tissues I'm going to talk about. Now, one thing that is hugely different is the amount of funding out there from federal sources, from industry, et cetera, to study these two. So we work in both and there's uh, global kinds of technologies that we can build, but then apply to specific disease models. Now, I, as I start, I'm going to introduce you to my niece, Caitlin Bradbury. She was raised in Atlanta. This is her in high school. I think she was in Mexico on a trip. And when she started, she's actually an MIT alum, a Sloney, um, works at Delta now in Atlanta. Um, when she started having her periods when she was 12 or so, she, they, they were terrible. She had to miss school. And her doctor put her on birth control pills, which is what you do for dysmenorrhea or menstrual cramps. Didn't really help. She got some relief, not a lot, but she, she started missing a lot of school. Her doctor made her have a lot of tests because she also had terrible gastrointestinal problems. She had colonoscopy, et cetera, et cetera. When all these tests came back negative, her female OBGYN told my sister, she's making everything up to get out of going to school. She was a top student at her school. My sister calls me. She says, what do I do? Lava shooting out of my head. Um, I got her referred to a, uh, so yeah, so this was a surgeon, uh, the OBGYN said. And so I got her referred to a surgeon in Atlanta through connections I had here. And she had surgery when she was 16. And it turns out she had stage three of something called endometriosis which occurs when that lining of the uterus, the endometrium, is found growing outside of the uterus. And it's found growing in a lot of places as shown here. It can grow on the abdominal wall. There's some lesions there that are very red. It can invade the wall of the bowel. And you see a couple of lesions circled in green there. It can even invade the diaphragm, the breathing muscle, and move through the diaphragm and get on the lungs. So there's many manifestations of this disease. And it's incredibly common. One in 10 women have this disease. And this is true around the world. So it's not just a disease of Western cultures. It's also a disease in the developing world where it has terrible manifestations. Um, right now, the disease is staged according to lesion burden. And that means that the more lesions a patient has and the bigger they are in certain locations, she gets more points. And at the end of the surgery, the surgeon says, okay, you're stage one, two, three, or four, but there's not a lot of connection between lesion burden and symptoms, and certainly not in terms of lesion burden and mechanism. And the therapies for this are all hormonal regulation, other than taking things like Advil. They're all birth control pills, menopause drugs are the most popular treatment. And many patients will go on to have two, three, five, 10 surgeries to remove these lesions. So not uncommon. So it's uh, 
a disease that we also don't understand its origins. Um, there's the little picture here uh, shows a common, uh, commonly accepted uh, origin is reflux of menstrual tissue. So some of the menstrual tissue goes out the fallopian tubes. The hypothesis is that it lands and grows, but there's also developmental causes that are very plausible because ectopic or outside the uterus tissue has been found in babies right after they're born. And there's beautiful studies out of other countries where they examined um, babies who died soon after birth and could find ectopic tissue in some of them. So very mysterious disease, still a lot of work left to do. Um, do I need to adjust something on my screen? It might, I think I hold that up, okay. Uh, let's see, something's changing. Um, yeah, and for this talk, I'm going to use terminology of women is, for, for purposes of this talk, and we can discuss later if anybody wants, a biological XX, so a uh, female sex and a gender female, because this is a huge patient population, the one we have most data on. It's not to mean that there aren't other populations that may be interesting to study. We just don't have a large N on them, certainly not in our studies. There's a related disease called adenomyosis, which is when this ectopic tissue is actually found in the muscle of the uterus. We are completely fascinated by this in my research program right now, in part because our clinical collaborator, Keith Isaacson at Newton Wellesley, believes this may actually be the source of most of the symptoms, if not even maybe the ectopic in the abdomen lesions. And it's interesting, so you see these beautiful, um, well, they're not beautiful to the patient, but these gorgeously uh, polarized, it looks like the normal tissue, but sitting there in the muscle. This is just crazy. It's also interesting to note that compared to a chronic inflammatory disease like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, there's an incredibly lower research intensity on this. In fact, NIH has only ever funded two grants on this, although probably 10% of women have it symptomatically. So there's some really great questions that we can ask and tremendous potential to help patients by developing drugs that are not uh, hormones because they don't work for a huge fraction of the patients. Now, one thing that is, again, super fascinating to me, and I think to a lot of more people are becoming aware of this, is the fact that you have this tissue that's causing enormous pain, suffering, inflammation, and yet it looks so much like the tissue that is in the normal place in the endometrium. When you have a tumor of cancer, for example, mammary, uh, a, a breast cancer, the cells get completely screwed up. So you see here a normal mammary duct and gland, the cell, there's a couple of layer cells, those dark, uh, dark stained nuclei, and they're very orderly. They're forming a barrier and they're all stuck together. There's a top and bottom and they're very orderly. But over on the right, we have a breast cancer and the cells have gotten all jumbled and they're just like going crazy everywhere. If we look instead at a lesion, of, well, first the normal endometrium also has these very organized cells. There's only one layer of them. And they're, so the, those little um, cyst-like structures are glands in the endometrium. And if we look at a lesion, the one I showed you on the previous slide, for example, we can see that that same structure is still there, even though it's sitting in the middle of a muscle. This is crazy because tumors like that are not even strong enough to invade muscle usually. And yet here you have this tissue that looks normal and it's like gone into the muscle and is causing all this pain and infertility and anemia and so on. So why does that happen and, and, and how can we help patients better? So one of the things that we did, I got... I had a very well-established research career and got pulled into studying this disease by a local surgeon. And one of the first things we did when we came in uh, to start working on this, and this is a collaboration with Doug Laufenberger and others at MIT and systems biology, um, it, it seems strange to us that a disease that 10% of women have, people were treating it like it's one disease. It's a disease or not a disease, you know. And right after we started working on this, I, um, I got breast cancer, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. 
And it was both a bad thing, but also a really great thing for science because I was immediately classified as something called triple negative, meaning I was negative for three markers that are used to understand the mechanism of the disease, the therapy you'll have, and the prognosis. And it's like, wow, there's nothing like that for endometriosis. Here we have this really prevalent disease. Some patients respond to hormone drugs. Some patients, a lot of patients don't respond. How could we maybe bring some lessons from cancer into classifying these patients? Because they're probably different groups of patients. We, we've got to believe that because there's some patients who respond and don't to the drugs that are already out there. So how could we possibly approach this? So we decided first, I'm going to give you a little vignette a very short one of how we analyze clinical samples to start thinking about molecular classification of patients. Because we figure we're never going to get anywhere if we're just treating it like everybody's got the same molecular disease. Because, you know, I didn't have the same cancer therapy that other people had. Why should we think that it would be any different for endometriosis? Okay, so, um, so this was what we went in, but how do we find these mechanisms and groups? Because in cancer, you have mutations, like you test for something called HER2, and there's amplification of that gene, and lots and lots of that protein, and you can make an antibody against it, and that's a fabulous biotech drug that saved a lot of patients, but we don't have those same kind of mutations in the endometriosis case. Um, so we set out to study various aspects of these tissues and particularly the nature of how the cells either in the uterus itself, so we can study the so-called utopic tissue, what's in the endometrium. We can study the fluid that's in the abdominal cavity. We call that peritoneal fluid and it's mostly immune cells. And we can study the lesions themselves. And so there's information we can get from all of these things. And we've also done some studies about the gut microbiome and other associated things, but the most informative so far have been in these categories. And so I'm gonna tell you a just one little story and then I'm gonna come back. And there's a lot of interest in understanding, is there something wrong with the places that the tissue is growing? Is there some kind of systemic immune problem? Or is there something about the endometrium itself? Maybe you've got an infection there and some, you know, there could be a lot of potential ways that that could be screwed up. So there's a lot of um, still mysteries about that that we're trying to solve. Um, and our goal in the end, again, to come back to this is that there's, you know, we're not gonna do completely personalized medicine where every single patient, you know, gets, genotyped or whatever, but there's likely subgroups of patients and we can find markers to classify those patients together and, and then get therapies that would be effective for those patients. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. Now, there's a lot of interest in, um, are there mutations that are not as bad as in cancer, but maybe mutations that are similar in some ways to cancer, but less bad? that are driving this. And this is a, pap a, a paper where th there's a lot of controversy about this, but over on the right, this is a, a very nice uh, paper from a, a group in Japan. And what they did is they used some specific uh, newer sequencing methods to determine that in the endometrium, you have all these different glands and each one, it turns out, is clonal. And so they tried to correlate little mutations that would happen in, you know, that were, that were genetic signatures of each of those glands to lesions, trying to say, okay, if the tissue is coming from a woman's period and it goes through the fallopian tube and lands on the ovary, a very common site, can we correlate this? So there's some correlation, but it's, it's not perfect. And this is not yet uh, accepted as a driver of all the disease because a lot of the lesions have no no mutations at all. So we're still um, searching for these genetic links. And until we really, really come up with better uh, understanding of the genetics, uh, we wanna think about other things we can measure, which are what genetics integrates, which is the proteins the cells make to communicate with each other and carry out their functions. So as engineers, we come in and say, okay, what happens to all these genetic changes? Well, it changes all the proteins the cells are making and how they operate communicating with each other. So we decided to look at cell-cell signaling proteins in these um, patients. 
and ask, uh, are there networks of ways the immune cells are communicating with the tissue that are messed up and are they messed up in different ways in different groups of patients? And there's a number of different um, tissue compartments you can look at. The easiest one that we started with, you know, because we go in the operating room and I go, I actually, this is a picture I took in the operating room at Newton Wellesley um, and we collect samples ourselves. And it's good to start out with the simplest samples to collect and analyze that may be informative. And in this case, that is peritoneal fluid. And so on the left is what it looks like when a surgeon goes in. Um, the first thing you see is this accumulation of fluid, which can easily be sucked out. And then we analyzed this fluid. We separated out cells. We separated out the proteins. And we did analyze 50 of these molecules involved in cell-cell communication. And back in the day, it was uh, not common to do this. It's very, very hard to do that quantitatively. And then we did a machine learning algorithm um, on these proteins uh, using a multivariate approach. And this was, again, just engineers pick up new map. When as soon as new map comes available on a computer, you figure out how to analyze your samples. It's not mysterious to use um, AI. And, and so what we discovered is when we did this, we didn't give our algorithm any information about the patients. We simply said, are there groups of um, individuals in whom there were changes in these that were the same and that these changes, we did a multivariate analysis to ask, are the changes correlated with each other? So some may be up and some may be down. And this kind of multivariate analysis gives a lot of statistical power. And in fact, we found a signature set of these, you know, here's a whole list of these molecules involved in immune signaling that about a third of the patients had. So this is a group of patients who may have similar disease. And then we, we used some bioinformatics and said, are there things about the immune networks that we could learn from published information about what they make? And we identified a cell type making these molecules. And moreover, the bright uh, green is a molecule inside the cell that's governing the release of all this inflammation. It's a molecule called June kinase. And no one had ever found that molecule controlling inflammation in the peritoneal cavity before. So this is very exciting, very exciting, because it's like, aha, maybe we'll have a new target for a drug. If we inhibit that molecule, maybe we could affect endometriosis, because okay, so it's very exciting. Okay, and moreover, we did a companion study on invasion. So this is a collaborator in Brazil, Maurizio Brau, and his patient had these two huge lesions in her bowel. She couldn't poop. So, he cut them out. He actually took out 10 centimeters of her bowel. And it turns out we did a similar bioinformatics study and we found that June kinase also was involved in driving the invasion process. So this is, this is amazing. Like the same molecule inside the cell, which is an enzyme that can be inhibited, is driving two of the processes associated with the disease. So surely this would be a great target for drug development. And aha, we discovered after we were doing all this academic work that a guy in industry, Steve Palmer, had been pushing Merck to take this through preclinical trials. He, got, he had been excited about this just because it had been implicated in other chronic inflammatory diseases like multiple sclerosis. So there were pharma companies developing inhibitors of June kinase, and it turns out inhibitors had cured multiple populations of endometriosis the rodents and the baboons. But when they took it into human trials, it wasn't successful. There was a lot of issues with the way the trial was designed that made us optimistic that the drug still might work if it was used properly. And what we found out is that any pharma company to go further with this was gonna need efficacy models. They wanted efficacy models that were not animals. They wanted human efficacy models. So that's where we came in to say, let's build the patient on, let's build the patient in the lab. Let's get samples from the patients, build her in the lab and test the June kinase inhibitor. So as tissue engineers in my lab, we look at regeneration or building a tissue by thinking about it. Okay, what are the building blocks? What are the biochemical cues? What are the biophysical cues? So the lesions, we 
do a lot of imaging of the lesions. And you can see on the left is a very special kind of microscopy. You take a big chunk of tissue, you clear all the lipid out, then you can stain it with a lot of antibodies and it's a big chunk of tissue and do something called light sheet microscopy and get a beautiful 3D image of a lesion. So that's a lesion from a patient. The inside was fluid filled because remember, you've got a beautiful, almost normal tissue just sitting in the muscle, was sitting in the muscle. So on the right is our engineering representation of all the things we want to study and control and culture to understand mechanism of why this is growing, why it's invading in something as stiff as a muscle. And although the lesions can occur, I've got a schematic where this is like a lesion in the abdominal cavity. They can be in a softer environment, but they can also invade into muscle, which is a very stiff, relatively a stiff environment. So our goal then is to get biopsies of patients and, and some of their blood for their immune cells and break them down, build a tissue bank. So we expand them in culture and then rebuild the patient and test drugs. So how do we do that and what's important in doing that? Well, a hugely enabling thing happened because it was really hard to grow those epithelial lining cells. No one could do it. And then a guy in um, Europe, Hans Cleavers, showed how you could grow intestinal epithelial cells as something called organoids by putting them in a special gel that came from a rat or a mouse. And, and so you could, you could expand the cells from patients and make a tissue bank. Then people started doing these organoids for the endometrium and the lung and all these other tissues. And now it's very standard. But the problem is, um, and this shows how, how you do it. So these are the glands from the patient. So we take the tissue and we put it, give it, a, um, put it through an enzyme and it and separate out all of the connective tissue, things like blood vessels and fibroblasts and immune cells. Then we have the epithelial cells because we have to get each cell type separately. Then we recombine them. So this is showing going from the patient's glands, we take it all the way down to individual cells, and then you put them in something called matrigel. Matrigel is an extract of a tumor that grows in a mouse. It's just this magic potion that in 1980s, somebody discovered could keep epithelial cells happy in culture. So you put them in a little like tiny droplet and you grow them. And so that's a picture of the droplets. But Matrigel, gel, it's this magic elixir, but it has a lot of problems. First, it comes from a tumor. So it has all these things in it you don't want your normal cells to see. It varies a lot from lot to lot. It's really difficult to work with. And it's not very good for the other cells. The immune cells don't like it. The fibroblasts and other cells, they don't like it. So it's not very good for tissue engineering. So what we did over a period of about 10 years is figure out how can we replace that with a completely synthetic gel. And we used approaches sort of like what people do with soft contact lenses. You know, you can make a soft contact lens be perfectly clear and reproducible and porous and so on. And so what we do is we combine a synthetic polymer and it's shown here as just this octopus looking thing with eight arms. And on the ends of the arms, as you see there, there's some orange ones and some pink ones, and we have some green ones and some red ones. So there's like four different little peptides that interact with cells in very, very specific ways. And we figured out how to do this by doing a lot of cell biology to understand what each of the cell types needs, how they need to be organized in a nanoscale and what the biophysics of the presentation. So it was an enormous amount of engineering that went in and then we combine them, make them into a gel by cross-linking them with a peptide that the cells can modify. So we put all those together. It's just mixing everything together. And then you get this beautiful, clear, little proto tissue and it's gorgeous and you can do imaging and people all over the world now are using this technology and we're in the process of commercializing it because it replaces that horrible thing from the mouse tumor. Um, so let me show you just a few little um, fun things with it. So we did a lot, it took a lot of uh, engineering insight to get this, to have all the different facets of it perfect, but we can grow a whole organoid from a single individual cell. This happens to be gut. 
because we started with gut because we had a lot of funding for that, but the same happens for the endometrium. So you go from an individual cell and you make this huge organoid. And these are mostly stem cells when you grow them in this form. And so now we apply this approach, we can try to recapitulate the features of these lesions. So we can look in the patient, we see the lesion, it has the epithelia, it has the stroma, it has immune cells. How can we now build a model of the patient? Now, super fun thing about working with the endometrium is of course it's regulated by hormones and you uh, have a menstrual cycle that you always have estrogen, patient ovulates, you get a lot of progesterone. And you know, so you get growth of the endometrium with estrogen, the progesterone prepares it for the embryo to implant. So it matures and becomes ready for the embryo. And then if you don't have an embryo implant, the progesterone falls and you have a period. Okay, so this is really interesting. And aside from the endometrium in women, almost all tissues are hormone responsive. So for example, a lot more girls play soccer as, as young women now. And women are, if they're menstruating and going through cycles, they're four times as likely to get an ACL tear while they're ovulating than while they're on their period because the connective tissue in the body changes so much throughout the menstrual cycle. So there's fascinating things that can happen due to these changes. And if you're male, you shouldn't think that we're shutting you out and just talking about something interesting for women because there's tremendous effects of sex steroids on immune responses in general. So there's certainly in women, but in men, men and women have very different on average responses to infection where men typically have more severe responses to most infections. Women get more severe responses to flu, but everything else men suffer more from as we learned from COVID. So there's fascinating things for everybody in the work that we're doing for the endometrium because we're building tools to study how sex steroids affect um, these in vitro models. Okay, so just as a warm up um, in the endometrium, in addition to the epithelia, there's many other cell types and the fibroblasts or the strom, we call them stromal cells, um, are very responsive to this progesterone surge. They plump up, as you can see here, they plump up and they make molecules like prolactin. Prolactin stimulates milk production. And there's many uterine disorders that are characterized by a failure of these cells to undergo those transformations. It's those fibroblasts then signaling the epithelial cells. So there's crosstalk between these cell types that determines the whole process of the uterus getting ready for embryo implantation. And so we worry about all of the different cell types. And just to give you a little vignette of how important it is to use our 3D matrix, we can compare the behavior of cells um, on the top in 2D versus on the bottom inside of our 3D gel. So the top is growing on plastic like everybody does it, the bottom, and we can compare how they behave in the proliferative phase and then the so-called secretory when progesterone is there. And the punchline is on the graph on the right where you see 2D, we give progesterone, and there's just a little bit of this prolactin made, a little bit. But if it's in 3D, we see a lot of it. So it's behaving much more like it is in the body. So even just taking the fibroblasts without other cells in 3D are great, but now we can combine the fibroblasts with the epithelial cells. Here, the epithelial cells are green and blue, um, and that means they're the green is uh, something called actin, and it's always at the top of the cell where the cell produces something where the baby would implant. But remember, we're mainly trying to actually mod model lesions, so we're making them cystic-like. And the red are the stromal cells. And you can see them interacting with each other as we go across a simulated menstrual cycle. So we've got this initial model with these two cell types. And if we give an inflammation cue, in this case, one of those immune molecules, the tissues get all like flat and the stromal cells are all excited. So we're um, capturing features of inflammation. And in fact, now if we give this inflammation cue, normally the cell, they would make a lot of that prolactin when you give progesterone, but they're not gonna make it when it's inflamed. So this is starting to recapitulate what happens in patients. 
And so we're getting there um, in some ways. But a very interesting thing now is um, we had this in a very soft gel that I just showed you. In the patient, the lesion exists in something like muscle, which is much stiffer and hard, uh, harder, harsher environment. So on the top, there's on the left, the lesion in the patient in the wall of her, the muscle of her uterus. On the right, you see that we have done that, um, that special kind of staining with a large block of tissue, cleared the lipid and the epithelial cells um, are the bright cells. You can see they're invading into the muscle. They've got those leading edges. Now, the, the really huge advantage of using our synthetic hydrogel environment is we can make it soft like the normal tissue, or we can make it really stiff like a muscle. You can't do that with matri gel. You can't do that with other ones. So on the bottom, you see the organoids in a soft matrix, and they're beautiful and spherical. On the right, they look all invasive like that, uh, you know, like the lesion. And so this is what we can do through engineering, is recapitulate those features of that lesion environment. And so that's a biophysical way. And, and we didn't even put any inflammation cues there. Moreover, we're now studying how these my, might be migrating through the muscle. Maybe they even go through the uterus into the abdominal cavity. We don't know. It's a hypothesis. So you can watch. This is in a very soft matrix. And so you can see the cells, the organoids are growing. The one on the upper is, is growing. And then you can see these lesions as they get near the surface, they're going to start to migrate along. And this may be um, the kinds of ways that as the endometrium gets near the muscle, it wants to migrate on something stiff. So this may be capturing features of how they invade the muscle. But now if we take these organoids and we put them inside a very stiff matrix like a muscle, they're all crinkled. And this is a little, the contrast isn't great, but you can see the edge of the organoid there and, and white. And these are proliferating. This is over four days. So this movie, and now you see it invading out to where the arrows are. So now we're capturing features of what's like might be going on in vivo. And we can only do this because we have the biophysical cues that are similar to muscle. So this is now getting to be the kind of model system that we can use to simulate uh, the processes we need for drug development. And I want to finish up in a couple of minutes here by going back to um, ways that we can use organs on chips to model the birth of lesions. Because what we actually want to do is look at how the lesions are interacting with blood vessels. Are they recruiting cells, uh, circulating cells, et cetera? So we teamed up with a colleague named Roger Cam, who's in our department, and uh, he uh, has invented a way to create little blood vessels in a microfluidic chip. So the chip up on the left, it has a central region in gray between two purple channels that have fluid. In the central region, you inject some cells inside of, in this case, fibrin, and they'll self-assemble to form little blood vessels that span that whole uh, the whole channel. And these blood vessels are stable over a long period of time, and you can flow cells through from one side to the other. So in his lab, he has used these for enormous amount of um, applications. In fact, they're commercialized, and you can come see these uh, chips from AIM Biotech here. Um, and, and so he's used them to do things like look at how tumor cells move out of blood vessels into the surrounding tissue and ask questions about how immune cells might be helping those tumor cells. So the movie on the bottom, the immune cells called neutrophils are red, and you can see the green cancer cell. This is over a period of many hours, and it's in this little microfluidic chip. Um, and so the cancer cell is moving out of the blood vessel into the tissue space and the neutrophils, the immune cells are actually helping it move out. And so then once the tumor cells have moved out, because this is, uh, you, you, can, you can, whoops, it was a little slow. You can watch the tumor grow over um, time. So these are incredibly, incredibly powerful methods. So we teamed up and got a grant from NIH to work together and our student, Ellen Kahn, this was her first experiment recapitulating the work from the CAM lab. And so you can see green immune cells are moving through those blood vessels. So this is a blow up. 
on the left. And so the immune cells can just move through the blood vessels. That's just her starter. But what she's been doing more recently is she's modified that original chip as shown here. So there's a little central region um, that you can, after you form the blood vessels, come back and put an endometriosis proto lesion. And so you can see on the right, that lesion then attracts blood vessels and they grow into it. So now we're getting to the place that we can start to examine how drugs are interacting with lesions by putting them into the blood vessels. And we can also observe things, for example, this is just the fibroblasts, not even the other cells, we can see that um, we, when we put the lesion in, there's beautiful blood vessels on day one, but by day four and day seven, they've started to be all destroyed. You can see they're just little punctate instead of being connected. They're all these little blobs. And we can also go in and, and do some permeability measurements. And that's because the fibroblasts are contracting and they're literally ripping the blood vessels. So there's mechanisms you know, this may be what's happening in the body because we always see these lesions bleeding in patients. It may be because these fibroblasts are just like yanking them and just destroying them. So really, really fun to study this. Okay, so I'm gonna finish up in just a, a couple of minutes by a quick tour through some other facets of organs on chips. The um, chips I just showed you require uh, th there's no pump embedded on the chip. And this is the dirty secret of all of these microfluidic devices that you see here. And there's some very famous ones, one from Harvard, lung on a chip, you know, Rogers devices. They have to have some kind of external pump, usually big clunky thing with a lot of tubing to get any kind of fluid to flow or maybe gravity, but not very good. So, um, Many years ago, um, we got pulled into working with a number of pharma companies to build models of liver. And this was our first um, so-called liver chip. And here we've just got little 3D um, reconstructed liver and literally a silicon chip was the first one. And on the right is just showing fluid flowing through this chip. But so many people were interested in this because it captured certain functions of liver. It's not liver, but kept the liver cells alive for a really long time. So pharma companies were really excited about it. So we translated this into a multi-well play format that companies could use. And this is the liver chip that's sold now by a company that licenses this from MIT. And the huge innovation that we did was developed together with Dave Trumper, who's in mechanical engineering here, a way to put the pumps right on the chip. So we don't have an external pump. There's pumps right on here. And it's he, he came up with a very clever thing. There's a plate on the top and bottom, and then there's a membrane in between. And what we have, uh, similar to, you see all these tubes, we have air and vacuum that rotate, that alternate and drive those pumps. And so this turned out to be incredibly powerful. And so a lot of companies use this liver chip. We collaborate with a number of pharma companies ourselves as does CM Bio. But what it also enabled is a very, very facile way to make interconnected organs. So we had a project with the Defense Department, DARPA, to make 10 interconnected organs on a platform. They wanted this to do pharmacokinetics and toxicology. So we built this, and this is in our museum, because this is a it's sort of a demo project that DARPA wanted for the milestones. But we've used this for many other, in smaller versions for other applications, like a three-way um, brain, gut, liver, to look at models of Crohn's disease, look at models of Parkinson's disease, where we have some very specific biological questions and so on. And um, for example, there's a lot of fascination in how the gut microbiome influences our immunology. One way it does that is by making something called short chain fatty acids, that fiber you eat, it gets fermented into short chain fatty acids. They go across the gut, they go to the liver, they have targets on the immune cells, but they also have impact on the brain. And there was work in a mouse model that um, these short chain fatty acids could potentiate the kind of inflammation in Parkinson's. So we built a human model of this and found some new facets of the inflammation. And this is the postdoc who did that work. He's now at Hopkins. Um, so there's a lot of things we are sorting out still on the conflicting uh, data. Um, now, this model didn't have a living microbiome, so we used the technology that we developed to make another device that let us uh, culture a human colon 
monolayer. So the green is a human colon mucosal barrier. And that little blue cloud above it are the bacteria that ferment the fiber. And they're very sensitive to oxygen. They're super sensitive. They can't stand oxygen. Don't even say it in the lab. But we can grow them continuously, and they will ferment and make the um, fiber. Okay, so those are some of the advances we have. We study a lot of diseases. But the really cool thing that we've done recently is take those big pumps and now make um, a miniaturized chip like that one that can be vac vascularized that also has the fabulous little pneumatic pumps. And so we're now in the process of building true endometriosis lesions with blood vessels in a pumped system. And so this is ongoing work that we are on near publication on. So we are actually starting a project to test June kinase inhibitors from patient samples where they have been stratified. And this is Steve Palmer. We were dreaming of this back in 2014 at the American Society for Reproductive Medicine meeting. And we actually just met last week and have planned all the experiments and they're ongoing right now. So it's been wonderful to meet you. I'm tremendously grateful to all the people who made this happen. And uh, I'll stop now and, um, and, and especially my clinical collaborators and Dave Trumper and systems biology with um, Doug Lothenberg. So I will stop now and wait for the questions. So those in the audience, if you have a question, raise your hand. Mine's just a quick question. I think you might have just said this on the last slide, uh, Professor, but uh, did you mention that you're now testing the June kinase inhibitor? We just started, we're just setting up to do that. And part of it is, uh, for any of you who know medicinal chemistry, um, there's a number of things about the molecules themselves that may make them a good or bad uh, ultimate drug for the clinic. And so Steve Palmer went to Baylor. To, there's a drug discovery institute there. And he has uh, worked with chem, med chem folks there. And they've developed some new, very interesting molecules that have features that may be more effective in this patient population. So we're starting with the June kinase inhibitors that actually were tried in the clinic, because those have been published. And we will be moving on to alternate um, entities uh, after we get those established. Other, other questions in the audience? Mia, do we have some questions from the chat? Yep, so our uh, question from the chat is, could you please discuss any potential circadian rhythm sensitivities to the cell response? Oh my goodness, circadian rhythms are one of our favorite, um, uh, <laughs> our favorite wish list things, in fact, we got an NIH grant to do circadian rhythms in liver at the same time we did the DARPA project. We had a collaborator then um, at Draper Labs who wasn't really able to do the hardware for that. We never really got um, sufficient hardware, but we're what we decided to do was wait until we got these new chips and we really are so interested in the circadian rhythms because they're certainly huge changes in the circulating immune cells at different times of the day. They're also somewhat influenced in totally mysterious ways by cortisol because cortisol varies uh, throughout um, the day and night. So this is really, really, really interesting. And it's also me, the cancer patient, I'm very grateful that I had uh, the chemotherapy I had and lived through, but there's a lot of interest in chronobiology of chemo agents. So there's there's a lot to learn on circadian rhythm, and we hope that we get the tools. I think in a couple of years, we'll have those kind of tools. We have another question from the chat. Uh, not... Question from the audience. Actually, I have a question about something that you just mentioned as an aside. Um, you were talking about how men and women have different reactions to COVID, yeah. and I had not heard that before. Can you... Um, say a little bit more about what the differences are? Yeah, so um, men had greater morbidity and this was published in many, many places. They were more likely to get sicker and more likely to die and have certain heart manifestations and so on. So I won't go into all that. I don't have you know the actual data in front of me, but it's um, observed 
by a growing community of people who care about sex and immunity, we actually have a discussion group for anybody interested on the topic of sex and immunity, where we gather together anybody in the Boston area who wants to learn more about this once about once every two or three months to have a seminar and then a poster session and social hour and, and panel discussion. And we've had Saber Klein come up from Hopkins and talk about differences in men and women responding to flu and um, other infections and to vaccines. And so women actually get worse effects of flu, but men get worse effects of many other kind, most other kinds of infections. And it has to do somewhat with the differences in the way the innate immune system responds to pathogens. So the innate immune system, like uh, macrophages and dendritic cells, they just recognize it's a bacterium or it's a virus. And there's characteristics of those that the innate immune system can just like sense. And men and women have different strengths of that response on average. And then that signals to the adaptive, to the cells that make the antibodies and then the T cells. And, and so uh, women tend to uh, you know, have more um, mutative response, but they activate the um, adaptive immune system in ways that seem to give them a predisposition to autoimmune diseases. So most autoimmune diseases are strongly skewed female. So things like rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, uh, MS, these are more strongly female. Um, even things like Crohn's disease, Crohn's disease has higher prevalence in boys before puberty, but then after puberty, it switches and it's more prevalent in women. Same thing for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, more prevalent in boys, and then it flips at puberty and becomes more prevalent in women. So there's a lot of these immunological responses that may be chromosome linked, but they may also be um, hormone influenced. So we have a lot to learn because we haven't, and the in vitro models we build are all driven by the need to do sex hormone dependent responses. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Griffith. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I, I was reading a little bit before this on like what you were going to speak about. And I think these humanoid models in general just sound fascinating. And I feel like the, the applications are, are really, really broad. Um, and so kind of along those lines, like I think today we like talked about modeling a specific disease. Like, do you see like applications for like drug testing and development in general in the industry? And then like, there's a whole industry now and it's uh, it's an interesting time it's an inflection point because most of you are probably too young to remember videotape when you have vhs and beta like you don't even remember videotape but there was vhs and there was beta and one of them won uh, but there's a lot of companies making different kinds of technologies and what's really hard is they'll make a technology that can do some kind of cell culture but there's not a lot of the conceptualization of the disease. Like, what do we really need to capture? What are the facets of how the cells are talking to each other, et cetera? So we're really at the infancy. And, and so then there's all these little companies, each with their little technologies. And pharma's going like, well, there's 50 companies. One has a kidney. One has a um, heart. One has a liver. You know, how do we consolidate that? So... One of the things we're trying to do is bring a common technology that could be used for a lot of different organ systems and say, what are the principles? How do we bring immunology in? How do we construct the 3D tissue with synthetic materials? All of that needs to come together. So it's not, it's moving toward that, but I think there needs to be a lot of consolidation on the industry side so that we get, you know, is VHS or beta going to win? And are we going to have you know, somebody can leap over and have everything recorded on a hard drive instead of videotape. We're sort of like that right now. But it's it's an area, I mean, it's intensely, intensely uh, active area. So yes, we will. We will humanize it. And I hope MIT supports this uh, effort a little more. Okay, we've got uh, one more question from online. Uh, are the responses of disease in women post menopause similar to those of male responses? So, mm -hmm. I don't know as much about that 
except that it's not identical. It's still not identical. You still don't have, um, I think you still retain some of these differences between responses to infection post but that's a, that's a great question. I don't know as much about that. It's a great question though. Okay. All right, well, I think that's about all that we have uh, time for right now. Um, for those of us, uh, those of you who are here in, in the room with us, please join us uh, in the lobby for, for uh, yeah, we still have, there's still some, uh, uh, some delicious food left and some soft drinks. And um, be, before we close things out, I would um, just like to take, take a moment to step into the closet behind me. <laughs> I thought it would take longer to answer that last question. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I can uh, like to um, small token of the club's esteem and uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for speaking. And thank you to the uh, my crew of volunteers, to Mia, Bob, and Bonnie, and uh, a hand for our speaker and and join us for more so more refreshments and socializing. Yes, thank you.